<laughs> Praise God. It's good to be back. Appreciate Pastor Doyce and Suzanne inviting my wife, Virginia. Virginia Stannis, my lovely wife of almost 45 years. Uh, we are now uh, a pastor for 44 years and now a full-time evangelist, uh, also president of a two-year Bible college. And we just purchased a building, a closed-down church in West Virginia, and we're going to start training uh, young men and women for the ministry, giving them a pulpit to preach in on Friday nights. So we're, we're busy, but we're excited. Uh, take your Bibles, if you have one, and, and stand to your feet as we read uh, from Mark, the fifth chapter. Mark, the fifth chapter. We're starting uh, with verse number 25. And when you arrive there, say amen. Mark 5, 25. And I see many of you really trust me because you don't have Bibles with you. So that means you're trusting me <laughs> with, with the Scriptures today. Uh, if you could put it on the screen for me, I'd like for them to be able to see the Word. Uh, background, uh, Jairus, a religious leader, his daughter's dying. He comes to Jesus and asks Jesus to come to his house and lays hands on his dying daughter. And Jesus says he will, and so a parade starts. What do you mean a parade? Jairus is out front. Jesus is following him, and a great entourage of people are going along to Jairus' house. In the midst of that parade to Jairus' house, verse 25 steps in, and we begin to read. And a certain woman, we don't even know her name, a certain woman. It's amazing how many times in the Bible somebody gets healed, gets touched, gets delivered, and we don't even know their name. But God does. Say amen. Now, you guys can learn to say amen here because I'm used to amens, okay? So say them at the right place at the right time. A certain woman which had an issue of blood, she's hemorrhaging. How long? Twelve years. Twelve years she's bleeding. Twelve long years she's bleeding. Verse 26, and she had suffered many things, many things of many physicians. Can I get a witness right there? I believe, I believe doctors can help us. I believe doctors are gifted. I thank God for medicine. I thank God for the medical world. But they are not God. Can you say amen? amen. They are not your God, and they are not your healer. If they can help you, it will only be God that brings the healing. She had suffered many things of many physicians, and she had spent how much? She spent all. I took two years of Greek, five days a week, 6.30 a.m. every day for two years, five days a week. I took Greek, and let me tell you what the Greek interpretation of the word all is. You've got to listen carefully or you'll miss it. The Greek interpretation for all is all. Did you get it? She spent all. She spent everything. That she had and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard about Jesus, faith does not come by me laying hands on you, pouring oil on you. Faith comes by what? Hearing. But you have to believe what you hear. Something will happen today at Oakmont if you believe what you're going to hear. If you're just there worrying about lunch, you won't get it. Did you hear me on that one? But if you'll listen, tune in, get your receiver ready, God will do something in the house. Lord, change the atmosphere in the house. And when she had heard of Jesus, she came. She came because of what she heard. She wouldn't have came if she didn't hear and believe what she heard. She came in the press behind. That's a key, behind. She came from the backside of Jesus, and she touched his garment. You need to underline that if, if you're doing some underlining. Garment. It's a key word. Key word, garment. For she said, if I, she spoke out loud, if I may touch but his clothes, garment, I shall be whole. Everybody say whole. whole. And straightway, straightway, it says, she touched and straightway, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt faith comes before feelings. Don't look at feelings. Look at your faith. 
she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction, the plague, the whipping, the scourging. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue, power, had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched me? His disciples thought he was joking. And his disciples said, verse 31, Thou seest the multitudes, thousands of people, thronging, pressing you, and you're asking who touched you? It's got to be a joke. Truly, that's what they thought. It's got to be a joke. See, most of them were touching him accidentally. She was touching him on purpose. Did you get that? Some of you are here just, you're just here casually. But I believe, I, I feel that somebody's here on purpose. Talk to me now. Somebody's here on purpose. You came for something. You're just not window shopping. You came. Can I talk to you? You came for something. By God's grace, you're going to receive. You're going to receive. And he looked around to see her. He knew who it was that had done this thing. And the woman, fearing a holy reverence, trembling, knowing what was done in her, came second time, fell down before him, and told him all the truth, the whole truth. There's something in that. You're going to see it. And he replied to her, Daughter, hmm, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. Be whole of your affliction. You may be seated. <laughs> oh, I, I'm excited because I know what's coming. You're going to see something today that I believe most of you have never seen in your entire life. Doesn't matter if you've been an old timer in the church for umpteen years. God's going to show you something if you'll lean in that you've never seen before. L let's go back to the scriptures again. Let's look at this woman's condition carefully. Let's look at, number one, she was diseased. It was an issue of blood. Uh, it was a hemorrhaging. Uh, very, very crucial. Very, very crucial. We know, and I, and I don't want to get in detail, but we know that, that a woman at a certain age begins to have her natural monthly cycle. But in the Scriptures, she's hemorrhaging in the female area, and it's gone on for 12 long years. The Bible tells us that this disease, this hemorrhaging, this flow of blood caused her to be defiled. Are you with me? Now, I want you to look on the screen at Leviticus 15, 25. The, the Bible says that because of the flow of blood coming out of her body, that she's considered unclean. Anyone, this is crucial, anyone that she touches or anyone or anything that she touches in Judaism, according to the law, is unclean. What do you mean unclean? Brothers and sisters, they had to go through a cleansing, a washing. They had to go through a ceremony any time they became unclean. This is the law. I thank God I'm not under the law. You're not hearing me. I'm not under the law. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. I've been set free from the law. I'm under grace. Go over to God. Anybody under grace? Grace is not a song. Grace is a person. Jesus, unmerited, undeserved, and unearned. Did you hear me? Unmerited. You can't merit it. Unearned. You can't earn it, and you'll never deserve it. It's a free gift. But she's under the law. And anything she touches or anyone that she touches becomes unclean. If she sits in a pew, everything on that pew becomes unclean. <laughs> Got to get hold of it. She's defiled, and under the law of God, she's unworthy to touch anything. <laughs> under the law, she's unworthy to be around anyone. It tells us in Deuteronomy 24, 1, that her husband has the right to write her a decree of divorce because she's unclean. After 12 years, 
of having a wife that's ceremonially and legally unclean, I will guarantee you she's now divorced. And no one's going to marry her. Anybody here? Are you getting a better picture of her miserable life? She's not only diseased and defiled, she's disappointed. Verse 26 said, She's gone to doctor after doctor after doctor, and the doctors in those days were the religious leaders, and they were a bunch of quacks. They had all kinds of remedies, all kinds of crazy stuff, and I'll guarantee you she went through all of them so she could become clean again. A lot of people say, well, I... I, I'm amazed that people will judge someone that's sick and they will say things like this. Well, if I was them, I wouldn't do that. When you're sick and you're suffering, oh, brother, you'll do it. Come on, somebody. You'll do anything to get rid of the pain. When I was a young whippersnapper preacher, I used to tell people, suck it up. But I'm older now. <laughs> I love old people. I said I love old people. I am one. I'm a card-carrying old person. <laughs> ah, glory to God. <laughs> there was a man that was worried about his wife, just worried about her. He, he thought for sure her hearing was, was going. And so he went to a doctor and said, my wife, she just doesn't hear me anymore. And the, the doctor said, well, here's what you do. He said, stand in another room. And, 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 and holler at her and see if she hears you. If she doesn't respond, move in a little closer and do it again. So it was about dinner time, so he was in, in the den, and he hollered and said, Honey, what's for dinner? No response. So, it, so he walked a little closer, about 20 feet. He says, Honey, what's for dinner? No response. He walks a little closer, and he said, Sweetheart, what's for dinner? No response. He gets to the kitchen door and says, Sweetheart, what's for dinner? No response. Goes right up to her goes right up to her, right behind her, and says, Sweetheart, what's for dinner? She turns around and says, I told you five times, chicken. <laughs> you know what's sad about that? Fifteen people didn't even hear it. <laughs> ever been disappointed? I said, have you ever been disappointed? She's no doubt discouraged. Luke 8, 43, same story, says she could not be healed by any. Every remedy didn't work. That's a discouraging fact. She cannot, the medical, the medical field of that day could not help her. Have you ever had a doctor tell you that there's nothing else we can do? I, I got a shout right here, but thank God for Jesus. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. Destitute. She spent all she had. She doesn't have a penny. She can't go to another doctor because she has no money and Obama wasn't alive then. Oh, God have mercy on us. If you're looking to the government, I pity you. Anybody here looking to Jesus? Spent every penny she had. And she's deteriorating every day worse and worse and worse i don't know in pastoring there's always some negative people in every church and and they're the kind of people that when they come in a room the lights go out you know what i'm talking about and they're the kind of people that if you're sick you do not if you're in the hospital you do not want some of those people to visit you because the moment they come into your room in the hospital and they see you they say oh my god and then they start telling you about their Uncle Charlie that died from the same thing and Aunt Lucy who had it and died three days later. You don't want those kind of people around you. Are you with me? You look worse than you did yesterday. Well, in this woman's case, it's true. Can you imagine losing blood every day and you're growing worse every day? She's anemic. 
she has no strength. When, you, when, you're, when your blood count goes down, you have no energy. You have, you have no vitality. And, and she's been going through it for 12 long years, blood just flowing out of her. And they did not have transfusion. She has no blood coming back into her body. Worse every day. Most would give up. She's a reject. She can't go to the synagogue. She, can, she, can't, she can't go out to shop. She can't go anywhere. The marketplace is to boot. Anyone she would bump into, they become unclean. She's an outcast. She's losing her strength. Her power is evaporating from her body. She's not only powerless, she's penniless. But she's also desperate i don't see see i travel from I, i'm in all kind of churches i'm in baptist churches i'm in methodist churches i'm in pentecostal churches i'm in all you're in pentecostal churches yeah and i'm not afraid but i don't see very many desperate people it seems like prosperity has not caused Americans to be stirred about God. It seems like the church in America is at ease in Zion. It almost seems like the church in America is comfortable. We've got it made. I mean, everything's seemingly coming up roses. But I tell you, I believe God has a way of turning and getting us to become desperate. You cannot stop a desperate person. Her desperation also has involved in it determination. You get a desperate man or a woman and a determined man or woman, something's going to happen. I believe it gets the ear of God. Verse 27 talks about her coming. She heard and she came. What did she hear? She heard about Jesus. Well, you've heard about Jesus, you, Billy Graham on television. You, you've got television. We've got Christian networks now on television. You, you've heard about Jesus. She heard something that caused her to believe that there's help if she gets to Jesus. Now, how did she come? She came talking. She came making a declaration. <laughs> Women speak 32,000 words a day. 32,000 words a day. Men speak 15,000 words a day. Hello? One, one man, foolish man, read that in the newspaper. He read that women say 32,000 words a day, and men only speak 15,000 words. And men are done by the time they get home from work. And women aren't even half done. Anybody home? So this idiot, I mean this man, decided he was going to tell his wife what he read in the paper. So he goes in and he tells his wife, says, Honey, do you know that you women speak 32,000 words a day and we men only speak 15,000 words? You speak twice as many words as we do. Boy, he was laying it down strong, stupid. And she came back with this reply. It's because we have to repeat ourselves twice when we're talking to you. And he said, huh? <laughs> I've lost all the men, but the women are right with me right now. <laughs> She came talking. She came making a declaration. Let me give you some advice, and, and write it down if you would. Every day, begin to make declarations over your life and the life of your family. Did you hear me? Every day, begin to declare biblical, scriptural things over your life and the life of your family. The mouth has the power, the tongue has the power of life and death. 
We've got to learn. Listen to me. Thank God that your spirit is saved, but your soul, your mind, your mo- you've got to be reprogrammed. Amen. You've learned from Egypt. Egypt will destroy you. You've got to have your mind renewed with the Word of God. Began to make declarations, and she made a declaration. She said, if I can touch, the word touch is a key word. It doesn't mean just go up. It means to cling to. It means to grab a hold of. It says here in Mark, his garments. <laughs> well, if you turn to Matthew nine twenty, it clarifies what she was saying. Matthew nine twenty says she touched. This is crucial. She touched the him. The border. See, some of you, it doesn't mean a thing. You're going to see something in a second. She touched the hem of his garment. Why? That's the key. Why? What? See, she, she didn't do this just because it was something she just thought up. She did it because she had a promise. Stay with me. <laughs> If you, if you turn to Numbers, the 15th chapter, verse 38 and 39, you're going to learn something today. God makes a decree in Numbers, the 15th chapter, it, 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 verse 38 and 39. Let's look at it. God says to Moses, speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels, 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 tassels. Where? Look at this. On the corners of their garments. How long do they have to do that? Throughout all generations. And to put a blue thread. Here's the blue thread right on that corner. Four corners. Four corners. And each corner has a tassel. Each hem, border, has a tassel. Are you with me? Every man... That was a Jew, had to have a garment with tassels on the four corners and a blue thread. And he tells you, he tells you in the next verse, verse 39, look what he says. And you shall have the tassels that you may look upon them and remember all of his commandments or his promises. Are you with me? This is a Jewish prayer shawl. It's called a tallit. This is a tallit. It's a Jewish prayer shawl. Every Orthodox Jew today will wear a prayer shawl. They wear them all the time. Uh, They wear them under their garments, outside their garments. They wear the prayer shawl. Now, the four corners, the borders, there's four borders here. They're called kenef. The four corners, Hebrew words, kenef. It's important. Kenef. Kenef. The tassels are called sitsit. Sitsit. They have the tassels on the four corners. Now, over in Psalms 91, oh, I'm going to show you something. In Psalms 91, verse 1, this is what it says. Psalms 91, verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the of the Almighty. Lock into that. Look at verse 4 of Psalms 91. Verse 4. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. How many of you all know that God is not a bird? Hello? How many times have you read that scripture? God's not a bird. He doesn't have wings. He doesn't have feathers. You still here? The four corners of the prayer shawl, the word Hebrew is kenef. That word throughout the scriptures can also be translated corners or borders, but it also can be translated wings. Wings. Stay with me. Stay with me. You may learn something today. Watch this. 
every time a Jew puts one on, he does this. He kisses it. You know why? Because they believe that the prayer shawl is the lips of heaven. Now, when the Jewish man has a prayer shawl, if he spreads it out, it's like wings. Are you with me? And the corners are called kneef, which means wings. So the Jewish man, when he is under the secret place of the Most High, he's under his prayer shawl. And when Jesus said, because Jesus wore a prayer shawl because he was a Jew, when Jesus said, go into your closet and shut the door, he was not referring to what you and I call a closet because most Jewish homes in those days didn't even have closets. So what they were talking about, when you go into your secret place, secret place, under the wings of the Most High, close yourself out from the world and talk to me. If you're talking to me about public things, do it like this. But if you're talking to me about private things, cover yourself up. Anybody in the house? This woman did not come to Jesus to touch any part of his clothing other than one particular area, the hem or the border or the kneef. Why? Remember, kneef means corner, border, or wings. Turn to the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi, the fourth chapter, Verse 2, you're going to see a revelation today what that woman did. Malachi, verse 2. Matter of fact, matter of fact, on the border of this prayer shawl is that scripture. On the corner, the kneef of that prayer shawl is that scripture, Malachi 4 2. This woman knew what Malachi 4 2. Malachi 4 2 was a prophetic word about the coming Messiah. Are you with me? Nod your head so I know you're alive. And that scripture says the Son, S-U-N, the S-U-N, not S-O-N. Well, why would it refer to the coming Messiah as the S-U-N? He's the glorious one. He's the bright and shining one. We. He's the son of what? Righteousness. You don't have, I don't have any righteousness of my own. All of our righteousness in this building piled up together is still a bunch of filthy rags. Say amen. amen. The only righteousness we have is him. So the son, the glorious one, the bright one, the shining one, the son of righteousness shall arise, shall come. Last, last book in the Old Testament is giving the Jews a promise that the Messiah is coming. And when he comes, stay with me now, there will be healing in his wings. You can't do stupid stuff. You can't do foolish stuff. It doesn't work. But when you have a promise... I said when you have a promise, you can hold on to that. When you've got a word from God, it doesn't matter what people think or say about you, sister. You hold on to the word because my God is a promise-keeping God. Put your hands together and give him some praise and don't patty cake. She just wasn't casually going through the crowd saying, well, if I could just touch him, I think I'll be made whole. No, no. She had a promise. If he's the Messiah, and there were many that came in those days saying they were the Messiah. If he is the Messiah, guess what? There will be healing in his wings. And all I'll have to do is cling to that blue thread, that blue thread that they, they had to put in the ends of their four corners, that blue thread was a thread of grace. She's unclean. She's not worthy to touch any man's prayer shawl. 
Because the moment that unclean, defiled woman touches it, she'll make it unclean. You can't make Jesus unclean. Notice that she comes from behind. When Moses said, I want to see your face, God put him in the cleft of the rock and showed him his back parts. This woman's coming behind. Oh, I've got a good word for you today. Jesus didn't come <laughs> so we could look at his backside. He came so we could look at his face. Well, I wish I had somebody that could shout in this house. It just would stir me up. I might even take off. I don't know. He's wearing his prayer shawl as every Jewish man would wear. She has a promise. And the promise is all I've got to do is cling to that corner, that wing, and I'll be made whole. If he's the Messiah, see, she heard about Jesus. What did she hear? She heard that he claimed to be the Messiah. She heard that he claimed to be equal with God. She heard that he was healing people. If he's the Messiah, then I know one thing. Malachi 4th chapter verse 2 will come into being. I've got a word from God. When I touch it, I believe what I've heard. Oh, church, listen to me. Start believing what you hear about Jesus. Churches now preach that he doesn't heal. They now believe there's no more miracles. That's a lie of the devil. I don't care who's promoting that. My Jesus is the same today as he was 10,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, and yesterday. Amen, church. I've read many times, I've read stories of revival. I've I read about healings in in foreign countries. I'd read about blind eyes being open, but I, in 44 years I never saw a blind eye open until my last year of pastoring. We had a, a revival that broke loose for 11 weeks. 680-some people were saved. They were saved for 88 straight services. The 89th service, no one was saved, and we stopped. But in the first two or three weeks of that meeting, we had a lady came forward. I didn't know that she was blind. She came forward, and she got healed at the altar. She began to cry. She could see. I don't know that would make a Baptist. A Presbyterian would start speaking in tongues if they believed that right now. But some of you just look at me with a strange look. Had a deaf man up in the balcony. A lady just hugged his neck. And when she hugged him, his deafness was gone. His ears were opened up, and he was healed. Hey, man, church. Had a lady with a brain tumor. She brought her x-rays, and she put them on the screen. Big, huge brain tumor. Doctor told her there was no hope. Prayer was made. She went back to the doctor. They did another x-ray. She brought both x-rays to the church. The one showed the tumor. The other one showed nothing. Of course, the doctor said the x-rays were mixed up. No, it was Jesus. I said it was Jesus. Do you know it's all about Jesus? <laughs> it's all about Jesus. It's not about denominationalism. It's not about whether you're a Baptist or a Methodist or Pentecostal. It's all about Jesus. He's the Savior. He's the healer. He's the deliverer. If you make it to heaven, you'll make it to heaven all because of Jesus. You won't make it there because you look good, smell good. You'll make it there because of the blood of Jesus that was shed on an old rugged cross. This woman had a promise. I'm talking to somebody. Don't you let anybody talk you out of giving up on that promise. By his stripes, I am healed. But, 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 Brother Wright, so and so, I'm not talking about so and so. I'm talking about you. I get so weary when talking to people and they say, Well, I can't do that. Well, the Bible says you can do all things through Christ, all things that God calls you to do, all things that He leads you to do, all things that He guides you to do, all things that He directs you to do. He will give you the power and the gifts of the Spirit to accomplish that. If He hadn't called you to do it, why should He gift you to do it? She pressed through the crowd and she reached out because she had a divine promise, a divine promise that there were healing in his wings and the moment she touched him she was cured how, how how long did it take immediately I said immediately now some healings are gradual 
Don't give up. Hold on to the promise. S some healings are instant. Some healings are assisted. What do you mean assisted? Well, the Apostle Paul, the great man of God who had special miracles flow through his hands when he laid hands on people, he told the young preacher boy Timothy, he said, take a little wine, take a little grape juice for your constant, consistent stomach problem. What was that? Well, Paul was laying hands on people and they were being healed. But with Timothy, he told him, take a little medicine. There's immediate healing. There's gradual healing. There's assisted healing. Don't give up. God's the healer. Her healing was permanent. I don't believe she ever hemorrhaged again. Her healing was complete. Glory to God. When Jesus, when Jesus felt power go out of his body because she grabbed hold of a promise. Power will always be released when you have a promise. <laughs> when he felt that power go out of his body, he turned and said, who touched me? I don't think she was able to, to get very far in the crowd. She, she may have been in the second row or the third row trying to, trying to evaporate, going, uh, going back home, no doubt. But no, 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 no. When God does something for you, I believe you need, I believe you need to make a, make a confession about what he did. Amen. You, because we overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And he was calling her forth. Who touched me? And his disciples, they joked about it and said, well, who touched you? And finally, finally, she came forward and began to confess. Key word that I hope you saw, the whole truth. The, what was the whole truth? Her testimony was the whole truth, truth. Truth is based on God's word. Well, what was her testimony based on? Malachi, fourth chapter, verse 2. I believe she told the whole congregation, that Malachi told us that when the Messiah would come, that there would be healing in his kinneth. When the Messiah would come, that there would be healing in his wings. I believe that. I heard about Jesus. I heard his claims that he was the Messiah. I heard his claims that he was the Son of God. I heard the claims that he made. I believe the claims that he made. And so I decided I was going to come and touch the wings of his garment. Now... Saints, you never want to ever, 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 ever base anything you believe on one thing. If there's only one person who ever did that, then I say, well, it could have been something else. Let's investigate for a moment. Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 56. Let's just see if there were anybody else that believed that there were healing in his wings. Stay with me. Wherever he, Jesus, entered into villages, cities, or in the country, they laid the sick in the marketplace and begged him that they might just, what? That all they wanted to do, they didn't want him to touch them. They wanted to touch the wing of his garment. Well, let's see if there was any power in what they did and it says and they begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment and as many as touched him were made what were made what wow see you've heard for years about the woman touching the hem but you didn't understand why she did that it was because she had a promise uh, go to Matthew and let's look and see if, if there's any other people that did the same thing. Uh, Matthew, the 14th chapter, verse 34 through 36. I know I'm boring you, but I'm as excited as can be. <laughs> let's look at it. And when they had crossed over, they came to the land of the, Gad the Gadareans, is what it is, Gisinereth. Next verse. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent out into all the surrounding region, and they brought to him all who were sick, Look at the next verse. And they begged. They begged. Wow. They begged. They begged Jesus. Well, what in the world? What, what are they begging him about? Well, they're begging him that all they wanted to do was to touch. Uh, th this is what actually happened. Jesus walked 
among the sick and they reached out and touched and everybody that's all they did just reach out and touch and they were healed is it is that what the bible says it says and as many as touched it the wing were healed i mean there were probably thousands and all he did was walk among them and they touched and when they touched they were healed it was not in the garment it was just a piece of cloth it wasn't magical are you with me? He didn't, he didn't wear a magical piece of garment. The, the, the Catholic Church would probably try to buy it and, 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 and sell pieces of it, uh, as they did uh, with so-called pieces of the cross. It was not a magic piece. It was in who was wearing the garment. He's the Messiah. God gave a promise. It's no longer in the garment. The, 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 the Old Testament the law, the Malachi promise was under the law. They wore the prayer shawls. You don't have to wear a prayer shawl. You're not covered by a prayer shawl. You're covered by the blood of Jesus. I'm talking to you. And the promise we have now is not in a prayer shawl. It's not in a wing. It's by his stripes I'm healed. And I have to, listen to me, I have to cling to it. I have to hold on to it. I can't just casually touch it. I've got to cling to that word and hold on to that word through dark days and dark nights. Got to hold. Mama, listen to me. I've got a word for your lost children. It's a word from God. How many of you have lost sons and daughters? Raise your hand. I've got a word for you. The Apostle Paul told a Philippian jailer, in Acts, the 16th chapter, verse 31, the man had asked, what must I do to be saved? And the apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, told the Philippian jailer these words, if, conditional clause, you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. Watch out. I've got a deal for you today. <laughs> he didn't stop there. He said, and your whole house, family. Put your hands together. That's a promise. You say, Brother Wright, that promise was given to a Philippian jailer. I tell you what, that promise was given to me. If you want it, hold on to it. Cling to it. But Brother Wright, they're a long way out. It don't matter how far out they are. My God can go out there today and get hold of them, shake them up, draw them in. It's your word if you want it. It's your divine promise if you want it. Yawn all you want to. If you don't want it, get out of line. Did you hear me? If you'll get out of line, I'll move up. If you don't want the promise of God, then get out of line. So I can get closer. Glory to God. Anybody here? I've told it before. I'm a professional buffet eater. I love buffets. Matter of fact, I'm a charter member of the Golden Corral. I am. They ought not let skinny people in the Golden Corral. What are you talking about? I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I go to the Golden Corral and I get my plate. I'm ready. I'm not looking. Buffets are not for looking. I get in line and there's a skinny dude in front of me. I can tell they've never been to a buffet in their entire life. And I got my plate. And this skinny dude... Is looking. So I wonder what that is. That looks good. I wonder what that is. Put it on your plate and move on. You can come back. They're holding up the line. If you don't want anything, get out of line. I'm hungry. I'm here to eat. If you don't want the promise of God, 
just get out of line. But you who are desperate, you who are determined, get you a promise and hold on to it. Now, Brother Wright, I did that, but some of the church people discouraged me. How many people did she have encouraging her? Zip, zero. It was her and the promise. You don't need 15 people saying, oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. It's no, because you'll find somebody, that, but the moment you get a hold of a divine promise, you'll find somebody to try to talk you out of it. And they may be sitting in a church pew behind you or beside you. I tell you what, no one could talk her out of it. Nobody. She went through a crowd. I believe she crawled. I believe she crawled. She crawled through a crowd. Pharisees, sad UCs, doubters. There was a mixed multitude of people. But she cra- and as she crawled through that crowd, she was speaking out loud. When I touch the wing of his garment, I shall be made whole. I'll guarantee you somebody that she crawled by said, Who is that crazy woman from Oakmont Church of God? Look at her. She crawled. To, li- listen to what she's saying. Something about touching the wings of his garment. She must think he's the Messiah. Hey! You know what's wrong with some of you? You're worried about lunch. My God, we come to church, and the, and the first question we ask, when's it over? My God, I want it to start. Can I get an amen? We got a lost and dying world. This should be a place where desperate people can come and hear about the promises of God and therefore whosoever will believe them. I'm a whosoever. And I've come to encourage you if you're desperate. (laughs) She came looking for a cure, but she found the Christ. The last The last thing that Jesus said to her, you will see twice the word whole. She came for a cure. She found a cure, but she found more than a cure. She found the Christ. She found the promised one. She found the Savior. You're talking about a sad, a sad, pathetic woman. She came to Christ sad, but she left glad. People all the time tell me, Brother Wright, I've got Jesus in my heart. My God, I hope your heart tells your face. Hello? Hello? What's in your heart? I pray that it moves 18 inches upward and hits your mouth and your face. We ought to be the happiest people on the planet. We come to church many times, and, and it's like a funeral parlor. You got Grandma Moses on the piano. You got her, her twin sister on the organ, and it's. A I talked to a Church of God pastor this past week. I went and prayed for them. They're launching into a multi-million-dollar project, and 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 the pastor, sweet, precious, uh, loved God, and said they had a woman in the church that that wants to give a million dollars, a million dollars to the project. You think that pastor's not excited? But do you know what she said? She doesn't. She doesn't want to give it now. You know why? Because they sing some contemporary songs in the worship service. What? You mean you're going to hold back a million bucks because of a song? There was a day when a mighty fortress is our God was considered a bar tune. Now, it's a pillar of the church. Don't you think that God's still putting some new songs into people's heart? Is it because we have drums in the church? Drums in the church. Oh, me, oh, my. I remember the first time I brought drums into the church of God. I didn't ask anybody. Eh. I was 26, fresh out of college. I knew everything. 
fresh out. I had a degree. <laughs> I brought drums. You should have seen the saints when they came in on Sunday morning and there were drums in the church. You, you should have just looked out. I had an office to the side and I creaked out. I, I just cracked the door and I looked out with a crack and you could see him going. I knew what they were saying. I can read lips. There's, these are not demon possessed. They, 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 these are not of the devil. Are you afraid that it may cause you to tap your toe? Oh, my Lord, look, look. Oh, God. I'm tapping my toe. I suppressed with brother. He was moving around. He didn't just get up here and look like a zombie. Wait down, but you demon. He was moving around. He actually was giving a little hop. And you know what encouraged me? He wasn't wearing Nike shoes, and he was getting in the air. He was getting some. He was getting some air time. It's not seeing to have a beat. It's not the instruments. It's who's playing the instruments. It's the anointing of the Holy Ghost. A woman holding back a million dollars because of the style of music. I'm not against hymns. I love hymns, but I'm not against contemporary. How do you think we're going to reach the next generation? Do you, do you think in your, in, your, in your mind, God gave you a mind, do you think that precious memories is going to win the young people of today? I love old people. Have I told you? I love old people. And I like precious memories, how they linger, how they often flood my soul. But young people don't have any precious memories. Hello? If you're going to get old of young people, you better have some life in the music. You know the difference between white churches and black churches? White churches, they sit around like zombies. Black churches, they talk to you. Preach, brother. Preach. Glory. They stand up while you're preaching. First time I was in a black church, I thought they were coming after me. But then I found out they're for me. It's about time we get so stirred that every once in a while, when the truth is being preached, we stand up and I say, I'll confirm that, brother. I'm with you. Oh, She came in pain. She left in peace. Peace. Her body was finally at rest. She came hurting. She left healed. Now she's free from her affliction. Literally, Jesus took the whip out of the devil's hand and said, you can't whip her anymore. She's free from her uncleanness. She's no longer defiled. What was that? Grace. She's free from her bondage. Twelve long years. She's free from her sickness. Free from her suffering. Free from her shame. Most of all, she's free from her sin. Because Jesus said, Be whole. And then in the same sentence, the second time, he said, be whole. First was her body. Second was her spirit or soul. Stand to your feet. I want to sing that healing song again. I want to sing that healing song, Kathy, the one you sang before. I believe whoever you are, that you can leave this building today changed. I believe you can be free from your sin. I believe God can set you free through Jesus and the blood from your sickness. The altar's open if you want to come. And you'll believe the promise of God. He will do what he said he would do. Father, in the name of Jesus, help this 
help this service to end with people being set free. Father, I pray those who are bound by a habit today through the anointing of the Holy Ghost you'll break and destroy that, that yoke of bondage. I pray those who come into the house of God today who are burdened down I pray through the anointing oh, Father we declare that you are in this house through the anointing of your spirit your presence and your power burdens will be lifted man woman whoever you are bring your burdens now to the altar if you can't kneel then sit on the altar it's not the position of your body it's the position of your heart if there's sin in your life Come and ask Jesus to forgive you. If you're suffering emotionally, if you're suffering physically, come and let the great physician who doesn't charge you anything, he gives you freely his grace and mercy. Come and let him today touch you. She came because she believed what she heard. Father, we believe. Help us to respond the way that desperate woman, that unnamed woman, how she responded. Huh. And we'll give you the praise and the glory. In the mighty matchless holy name of Jesus I share one thing before we start to sing he called her daughter he knew her name he knows everybody's name but he called her daughter and I've often wondered why he called her daughter and then I found out <laughs> a Jewish man wearing a prayer shawl there were only two women that could touch his prayer shawl. One was his wife, and one was his daughter. He was clearing up any misunderstanding from any legalistic people that were in the crowd. Who is she that she could touch the garment of a rabbi when he called her daughter? He calls you his son or his daughter, and he bids you. <laughs> oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. He bids you as sons and daughters <laughs> to come and touch him. Let's sing in Jesus' name. The altar's open. You come quickly.